Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on mainstreaming gender along the resettlement continuum towards an inclusive integration approach. I see many participants joined us for this event, so I'm very happy to welcome all of you. My name is uh, Geertre Lano. I work at the IOM regional office in Brussels as the regional specialist for migrant integration, labor mobility, and human development. And today I will be uh, your moderator for this webinar. It's actually the third webinar already that we're organizing in the context of the COMMIT project. Um, COMMIT is actually a project uh, funded by the European Union that aims to enhance the integration of uh, refugees um, that are being resettled uh, towards EU member states. And we particularly focus in this project on women and youth, which is why for today's webinar, uh, we wanted to look more specifically at gender and how we can strengthen gender mainstreaming from the pre-departure stage, starting with the pre-departure orientation training to the post-arrival um, integration support. Um, Alice, can I kindly ask you to move to the next slide so we can uh, look at the program of today's webinar. So uh, we will start actually our webinar with a brief update on some recent EU policy developments in the area of resettlement. And for this, we have uh, Severin Oringi Fleischmann with us, who is a policy officer at the European Commission uh, DG Home. And she will tell us a bit more about the recent policy developments, perhaps also touch about the new pact on migration and asylum. After that, uh, we will hear a story from a refugee herself. We have uh, with us Rania Dia Rbekerli, who uh, is a Syrian um, refugee who has been resettled uh, to Italy, and she agreed to share her story and her experiences uh, with us. We will then hear from Anna, Anna Giustiniani from IOM Rome, who is the COMMIT project manager, and she will tell us a bit more about the guidelines that we've produced about mainstreaming gender in pre-departure orientation. And then finally, we will move to the post-arrival integration sphere, and we're going to hear from Elisabeth Palermo, the project coordinator of the Equal City project, who will tell us a bit more on how we can mobilize uh, local authorities and frontline services uh, to better include gender aspects in their assistance to migrant families, women and girls. And then at the end, we will have the closing remarks from the director of the IOM Coordination Office for the Mediterranean, uh, Lawrence Hart. So we have a, a full and a nice program for today. Um, of course, we are also eager to hear from you, the participants. Uh, so should you have any question, any comment as we go through today's program, uh, feel free to use the chat function. You will see at your screen below there is a chat uh, a chat function, uh, you can click on the chat and you have the option to send your questions to all panelists. Um, so don't send your questions to an individual panelist, please send them to all panelists so I can also see your questions and I will then direct your question um, to the panelist um, in question. Um, so that's it for the program. Alice, I think we can move to our next slide which, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, just a quick overview of COMMIT. What is COMMIT? COMMIT is a project uh, funded by the European Union under the AMIF, the Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund, and it looks at pre-departure and post-arrival support for um, refugees who are being resettled uh, to Europe. Um, we have a particular focus on the following countries, Croatia, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. But at the same time, some of our activities, like for example, these webinars are of course open to any participant in any country um, in Europe. The next slide, please, Alice. So here we see uh, the specific objectives of our COMMIT um, project, which, um, as I said, has a focus on women and youth. And we look at the full resettlement continuum starting from the pre-departure stage where we want to see how can we enhance pre-departure orientation um, for these specific groups. So in our previous webinar, we launched a youth curriculum for 
um, pre-departure orientation for refugee youth. Today we'll be looking at gender aspects in pre-departure orientation. Under COMMIT, we also look at how we can enhance community support in receiving communities. We have um, a partner in the COMMIT project who's piloting a mentorship scheme, for example. And of course, we want to foster the transnational exchanges built on the experience of all of you uh, amongst, let's say, resettlement countries that are perhaps more experienced to share lessons learned and good practices. So I think with this, uh, we have introduced uh, the webinar and the COMMIT project, and I think we can move to the next slide, Alice, which is the policy developments in the area of uh, resettlement. And I'm very happy to introduce Severin Oringi Fleischmann, a policy officer at the European Commission, DG Home, who will tell us a bit more about the latest policy developments in the area of resettlement. Severin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? I hear you perfectly. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Indeed, um, um, to present my talk very briefly, I'm, I'm uh, a policy officer at DG Home in the unit in charge of legal pathways and integration. Uh, I've been in this position for about a year and a half now. Uh, but I've been dealing with resettlement before joining the commission uh, from the member state side for the seven years before. So resettlement is a, is a topic dear to my heart. So I'm very, very happy to participate to this event. Uh, as we all know, a successful resettlement program is one which succeeds to fully integrate all resettled refugees, including women and youth, into their new host society. And for, start, for that, of course, starting the integration process even before arrival with adapted pre-departure orientation is, is important to facilitate integration. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the gender aspect uh, and how they can be better uh, taken into account really in the pre-departure orientation and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you. Um, without further delay, let me uh, briefly uh, present the Commission recommendation on uh, legal pathways to protection in the EU, uh, which was released as part of the Pact on Asylum and Migration on the 23rd of September. Um, the pact really set up um, a European framework from migration and asylum management. It's really based on the comprehensive approach where all elements are integrated. Um, and the fact that this recommendation was adopted as an important part of the pact shows the importance that the Commission is giving to safe and legal pathway to protection in the EU, not only now, but also in the years to come. The recommendation has three main focus. It reaffirms the EU commitment to resettlement. It encourages um, member states to develop other legal pathways for social need of protection. And it's in addition to resettlement. We'll come back to that. And the recommendation also calls for promoting community sponsorship schemes and uh, as an efficient way to better integrate refugees arriving through those legal channels. Let me get back to some of those points a little bit more in detail. Um, so about the EU commitment to resettlement, really the recommendation reaffirms the strong EU support to resettlement. It calls member states which do not have currently operation to start resettlement. And right now we have 16 member states actively engaged in resettlement and we hope we could have more starting or resuming because some had stopped temporarily their programs. Um, so states already involved. Uh, the recommendation, of course, takes into account the fact that the pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic, had significantly uh, impacted uh, and disrupted the implementation of resettlement. We all know that it will have a major impact on the 2020 pledge made by member states of almost 30,000 places. Um, due to the disruption of operation for months and the closing of borders, we know it will be difficult for many member states to fill the places before the end of the year as initially planned. So we really encourage member states to resume their program as soon as possible, and many have already done so, so it's very encouraging. Um, nevertheless, to, full, to ensure really the full implementation of the pledge, uh, it was decided to extend the implementation period until the end of 2021. And uh, the implementation period of the ME funding, which uh, was uh, secured for the 30,000 places, as um, previously called the lump sum or incentive payments, that will be also extended until the end of 2021. 
Uh, of course, the Commission really remains strongly committed to earth resettlement, and it's our collective ambition to scale up resettlement at the EU level as soon as the situation gets back to normal. Uh, beyond the quantitative aspects and number of places, uh, the recommendation calls for ensuring quality resettlement programs. And this part is especially relevant to the discussion we have today because it calls for both strengthening pre-departure measures and putting in place efficient integration and social inclusion programs upon arrival. And your program really is a good practice for how to better adapt with the part of your measure to the specific needs of refugees. And we really hope the tools that were developed uh, through this program could be uh, widely disseminated. Uh, in addition to resettlement, for the first time, the EU calls on member states to really consider other admission programs. Uh, in addition and not in replacement to resettlement. And one of them is humanitarian admission. And we already know that there is a, a wide array of humanitarian admission models already developed in the EU, and that could include, for example, the humanitarian corridors or some family-based private sponsorship schemes. And, um, and we encourage member states to innovate or to adapt existing models to their specificity. Another aspect is facilitating uh, family reunification. You know, it's an important legal pathway because we, we know that the wish to be reunited with family members is often a driver for migration. So not only member states can provide assistance to family members to access their legal rights in line with the EU law, because, you know, we have the directive, the 2003 directive on family reunification, uh, which needs to be fully implemented, but barriers to access sometimes do happen, so member states can help to facilitate access to this right. And in addition, member states can also extend the scope of family members who, who are benefiting from family reunification through, for example, humanitarian admission programs like the one I mentioned, family-based private sponsorship schemes. Um, in addition, the recommendation really encourages member states to pilot and expand other complementary pathways, such as the one uh, linked to education and work. Um, states are really called to work with universities and, and the private sectors um, to uh, facilitate access to existing legal pathways for the, those in need of protection. Those pathways can provide solutions for people who are not necessarily eligible for resettlement, but because they are not considered vulnerable enough, but they remain in real need of a durable solution in a third country. And those pathways take into account the skills and qualification and motivation of individuals in need of international protection. So they can be really a win-win situation for both the refugees and the member states. As last but not least, really the recommendation calls on the member states to promote community sponsorship scheme. And that is another new element of this recommendation. Um, the important point is really to give communities, individuals, civil society organizations a strong role in the integration of newcomers. There are many evidences that community sponsorship has many benefits. And we believe it is important that it complements what member states provide to refugees, the partnership with the state. It doesn't take away the responsibility of the state. Um, community sponsorship is really providing moral support and friendship to make refugees feel welcome in their new society. And you will find reference of community sponsorship in various places of the text because it is cross-cutting. It can underpin resettlement, it can underpin humanitarian admission and other complementary pathways. And we would like really to work with member states and other partners on developing a European approach to community sponsorship. And to do so, we need to take into account the EU asylum laws that already give many rights to beneficiary of international protection. And uh, in addition to provide uh, political support uh, with this recommendation and operational support to the member states with the help of EISO, um, one way the EU can provide support uh, to develop those programs is by providing financial support. So I want to mention the 2019 call for proposal under Anishin in Action to, uh, to support community sponsorship. So the procedure has now uh, been concluded uh, and agreements are being signed uh, with the applicants and uh, five projects should start uh, in 2021. At last, uh, the 2020 calls uh, aim uh, to support action in favor of complementary pathways for persons in need of protection. And we will look to support really innovative programs which will facilitate access to study in European universities, 
facilitates access to work-related uh, residence permits uh, for those with relevant skills for the EU labor market, um, to enable family members of be beneficiary of international protection to really join them safely and legally to the EU, and also to promote new initiatives to es establish community sponsorship schemes. Uh, so I think uh, considering the topic of today, we will be glad um, to know that the call indicates that proposals should ensure specific attention to women in need of international protection, especially those uh, in potentially vulnerable situations. Uh, this new call has been released on the 16th of October, so it's really recent, and application has to be submitted before the 16th of February 2021. And we encourage you to um, look at it and propose innovative programs. So to conclude, um, and uh, as you see, there's a lot is happening in the field of resettlement, humanitarian admission, and complementary pathway at the EU level. It is exciting times with a lot of opportunities. Um, so I look forward to, to the discussion today, and uh, that's what I wanted to mention. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Severin. Very interesting to hear these updates in the field of uh, resettlement, but also to hear the thinking of uh, the European Commission around complementary pathways. Um, I see um, a question from a participant who's asking if we can share the link to the new EU call for proposals. Um, yes, of course, uh, yeah, we can yeah, share yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we will put it in the chat for everyone so that you can uh, see the link to the new EU call, the AMIF call. As Severin said, it is uh, just being launched and it includes priorities both on integration as well as on complementary pathways. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Severin, for uh, this update. Um, I think that really sets the scene. And as you rightly said, um, it's very important to link the pre-departure with a post-arrival and at the same time, you know, keep in mind the needs of specific groups such as youth and women. And of course, um, under commit, we are happy to, to share the tools um, that we are developing, uh, starting from the guidelines on mainstreaming gender and, and the youth curriculum. But there's more uh, to follow as well. So good, Severin. Um, thank you. I think we can move on to the next uh session of our uh, webinar, which is actually to hear the experience uh, from Rania. Rania is a, a refugee from Syria who has been resettled to um, Italy, and she kindly agreed to share her story with us uh, today. Rania, can you hear me? I think you, you might need to unmute. Hello? Yes. Good <laughs> uh, good morning and I wanna say thanks for every stop in the IOM and the UN and for let me give me a chance to participate with you. So I yes. hope uh, to be uh, efficient or something for this thing. Yes, and likewise, we really appreciate that, you know, you agree to share your story um, with us and all the other participants uh, online, because for us it's very important when we talk about refugees to also hear from you and what was your experience. Um, so, Rania, I actually would like to start with this question. If, if you can tell us a bit more about your experience as a Syrian woman being resettled to, to Italy, um, what, what's your experience uh, and, and what are perhaps also some of the difficulties you, you encounter? Well, I, I can say the resettlement uh, process is a huge process and it's a great step. Uh, the only thing that you need to be strong to go in this step. Uh, I feel a little bit scared. I, I couldn't um, be sure 100%. The idea is when I arrived to the airport, it was good. After getting out of the airport, I need to meet the star stuff. I know that I have to meet the new person, but I didn't meet them before in the video chat or Skype in the course in Lebanon. So maybe if I get an idea to meet these people through the Skype or through the Skype, it will be more feeling safe uh, for doing this. The idea is that uh, when I get, I need to go out with them in the car 
there were two men and um, it's better, I think, in the first step to be a lady in this step to be more safe feeling. Uh, it needs to be a translator because I have a problem with the language. I don't know any word in Italy, in Italian, so maybe the language it was a problem for me. Um, when I even arrived um, to the office, it was in set, uh, all the time I was concentrating on the road, giving some idea or indication about uh, in a kind of map. Uh, how much far the place from the airport or uh, giving some indications to put with me or the lady with me in the car can so uh, in this way you feel more safe. Um, in the office, uh, I had another problem with the language. So maybe if I get a course uh, of basic Italian, uh, can the communication, it will be better. I can explain myself better to them in the office. Um, the problem of the house, uh, when I get, I know that the house is sharing house and it's a, a reception uh, uh, collecting house, but I didn't know how much privacy there was. So for me, uh, example, I had a problem with the privacy. If I had um, a video chat or a talking or some photos that show me how much I, I will be sharing with the other ladies or if I have to share with the other ladies the, um, the stuff, the other stuff, it will be better. I will not spend energy and time serving or trying to solve that problem. And in that case, I want to uh, become independent very soon. So um, I have to be able to start my work in my field as a physiotherapist and rehabilitation. It wasn't easy because as soon as I tried to search for a job and uh, I, I want to work, I realized that I have to put in a, to follow up with my certificate. It has to be valid in Italy. So that was a great step. I really thank the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. They helped me a lot. And uh, it was a big step that they made my certificate uh, valid in Italy. But according to that, I am in the medical field. I have to make my certificate valid and take the permission from the Minister of Health. So that was a problem because I need a local person to be uh, with me, uh, an Italian person. It's not easy. Your language it should be good in Italian, and you have to follow with them constant, uh, constantly by email, by call, there's a lot of documents, and thank God I bring uh, some uh, original documents with me. For the refugees, it's not easy, because there's a lot of people that cannot bring the original documents. Maybe it's better, I, I don't know, but maybe it's better there should be some exception uh, for the refugees to go on in their life, either in the university or either in the work, the ministry. So I, I need to follow up with them. It took a long uh, procedure, one year and a half, to get a permission from the Ministry of Health, and even the language is less difficult. In general, I think uh, there was um, the survey, uh, the I feel that there is an empty chain. There is uh, the process. It has a fragmented point, missing point that makes me spend much time and energy to understand what's going on. Uh, the other thing that I have is uh, maybe the document it should be uh, for the resettlement person it should be sent before and working with these documents to save money it will save uh, time and energy for the resettlement person if you want to continue the study if you want to work. Um, the problem of uh, the person arrives he doesn't know everything. It's better to be with a hosted people, like a hosted family or a hosted center. They help them in the daily living, in the daily living the needs, the street, how to work, how to do a contract. They should be a lawyer. They should be a psychologist. The lawyer should follow up uh, with the resettlement person um, because it will give him an idea how he will do a contract, what is the particular IVA, how he will start working. What is the law for him? If he wants to rent a house, how he will do, how will he start his life? And I think this is the important thing that uh, the lawyer, the resettlement person uh, needed, uh, especially for the ladies. Uh, 
the ladies all the time they need support they need how to do and depend on themselves Thank you, Rania. I, I, I just wanted to pick up on something you just uh, mentioned, so I understand some of the challenges relate also to the fact that um, you, you didn't know where you would, uh, you know, the, the people who received you. Um, we are now trying to pilot something new on the summit, where indeed already in the pre-departure orientation you could um, uh, speak with, uh, the, for example, the mentors. Uh, do you think this this would be helpful? Um, the type of mentorship scheme that that we're trying to pilot. Do you think this would have another value for refugee women? Yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, very important to have this. And uh, as I said, the language is, uh, is courses of language for the person before he arrives. It's important the courses for the staff uh, working with the foreign people is very important. And uh, this is um, one of the things that helps communication. And uh, even the person himself, if he's a single like me, I, I arrive completely single or completely depending on myself or if they are family. And I think uh, we have to see this kind of problem and try to solve it. And there's one thing I want to say even uh, when now uh, when the refugee or the resettlement person arrives, the main important thing is a team card to give him in the emergency call. Maybe he needs some calls or he needs to call the insurance card and the debt card with some money to help them at the time he arrives because otherwise there will be a great uh, problem for him to solve this. Hello? I, I couldn't hear you. Hello? <laughs> Sorry, I, I wanted to ask if you can mute when I speak because otherwise there is a bad echo. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's better. Thanks a lot. Um, Rania, I wanted to convey also a, a question from one of the participants um, who is asking um, if you received any pre-departure um, orientation um, and, and how was that. And secondly, from my side, I, I wanted to ask about, you mentioned uh, the, some of the problems about uh, the recognition of your uh, qualification, if I understand. Um, can you maybe explain to the participants um, what, what's your profession and if in the end, you know, you manage to get your qualifications recognized and, and get into the, um, the labor market? Would you be comfortable answering that, Rania? I understand. Yes, good. Okay. So I am a physiotherapist and rehabilitation. So what I add that I have to make my uh, certificate recognized in Italy, first from the Ministry of Affairs, the Foreign Affairs, because I'm not Italian, and then the second step to be uh, to take the permission from the Ministry of Health. So that uh, is important to start either by studying to continue my uh, studying in the university or for working. And my problem was that it takes a long step because I don't uh, have a good language Italian. I didn't understand what the Minister of Health they need. And I need a local person to be with me to follow up with me. I'm, I'm working now. I have a domiciale. I have a patient that I go uh, to their house, and I'm working with a group of um, Italian group uh, that they send patients to me. I'm working uh, all the day, so I'm, I have my job now. I have a contract. That's excellent to hear, Rania. And uh, I understand that you know it was challenging to go through the process of you know getting your certificate recognized, but in the end uh, you managed. So congratulations that you know you're now working as a physiotherapist. That's that's great to hear. There was um, uh, one of the participants who was asking about uh, if you went to any pre-departure um, orientation. Could you tell us something about that? Did you receive a course um, before you departed to, to Italy? 
Yes, I did have a course in uh, Lebanon for three days, and that was a great uh, help for me. It's a great information about Italy, what, where I should be, information in general. And even they tried to explain everything for me. And they gave me a kind of uh, small book to give a great information, more information about uh, how I live the law and how what I should do in Italy to go on in my life. Ramia, I, I have one more question um, for you. Um, is there something you would like to tell to other um, women who will uh, experience the settlement? Um, because you, you have gone through this. Uh, do you perhaps have, you know, a message or an advice for other women going through the settlement? I want, okay, I want to say it's important that to be strong, your dignity is the, the first thing you have to look at. Uh, God give us the uh, heart and intelligence, so if you have just to control your emotions, uh, we are we are strong than we think of, and it's very good to keep uh, trusting yourself. Don't listen to the other people. Don't listen to the people they try uh, to um, uh, block the streets for you. It's trying to go on in your life. The important thing is that when you reach settle, that means you start, you start your life, you set your life. That means you have to get your culture and this a new culture and you have to get in the community. Try to live with the people, try to learn from them and give for them because life is this, to give and take. So it's important that you have friends. I have a best friend for me. Is in Tete, and I, and you have to get in a relationship with the star with the office that they want to you. I still have my friendship with them, and I really thank them very much. They helped me in, in several of things. Thank you, Rania. It's, it's good to hear about your experience and about the positive things, but also the suggestions that, that you give in terms of, you know, what could be improved and definitely, you know, the importance of the language, learning the language, um, this, this is essential, uh, but also the community support. And I think Severin mentioned that in, in her presentation, the importance of, you know, community sponsorship so that, you know, um, when you arrive, there is also, you know, a community uh, that you can rely on a community to welcome you. Um, I, I think this, this is indeed, you know, um, very important as well and uh, related to the labor market, the recognition of qualifications. Um, I believe this is also something uh, the European Union is looking into now. I'm sure you're not alone in that experience. Um, we hear it very often that it's extremely difficult actually to get your qualifications. Uh, recognized it's a long process, um, the language obstacles sometimes as well uh, to integrate into the labor market. Uh, but so we're happy to hear that for you eventually it worked out and definitely we take note of also all the suggestions uh, you have. I see in the meantime that some um, um, another question came in. If you don't mind, Rania, I will ask you the question from one of the participants. Um, was there any support group from the host um, community? And do you think it could be a good idea to work on promoting a network for women who are settled alone? Would you like to respond to that question, Rania? Rania, would you like me to, to repeat the question, perhaps? Yes, can you yeah. repeat the question, please? <laughs> yeah, so it's a question from a participant. Um, can, can you kindly mute yourself for a moment? Yeah, so it's a question from a participant who is asking, when you arrived, um, was there any support group in the community um, where you arrived, um, a support group for uh, the resettled refugees in the host community, and do you think it could be a good idea to um, work on um, a, a specific network uh, for women who are resettled alone? Because perhaps, um, you know, you as a being resettled alone, you face uh, different challenges than families. 
Something that uh, can you mute, please? <laughs> Something that uh, wasn't mentioned yet, but the digital skills, and especially now during COVID, I see how much you know uh, we all rely on doing things um, online. Uh, we need you know our ear for everything, um, and I, I can only imagine you know how difficult it can be if you don't have these digital skills to to navigate your your new life in the host society. So I think it's a very good suggestion as well to focus a bit more on the digital skills and make sure that you know um, it's it's possible actually to. I heard once you know from a refugee who couldn't make an appointment with a doctor because it had to be done online, and even that was you know an, an, an obstacle. So let's not forget this. Um, and I, I have a final question from another participant. If I may, Rania, um, who's asking, what was the most challenging part of your resettlement um, and integration process besides, let's say, the, the, the recognition of your qualifications? What would you say was the most challenging part of the resettlement and integration process? Uh, I can say is um, it, it's important for me when I arrived to Italy, the main point for me is to continue my study and to find a good job to live with my son as a single mom. The good thing of the resettlement project is to give you another chance in your life to do what something you couldn't do it in your uh, city. Um, uh, that is a positive thing for me that another chance in my life to start a new life. Maybe I can change my specialty. Maybe I can uh, do something that I couldn't do it in my city. Um, besides the problems, besides the, the difficulties that I found it, I'm now going on in my life. And I have a, a good relationship with my patients. And I'm trying to do and go on to have a house, to, uh, do, uh, to have a good life with me and my son and my family. And for sure, my family were supporting me all the time. In <laughs> Germany, I always was talking with them. So I thank them all. Thanks a lot, uh, Rania, and also from our side, we're very happy that you got this uh, new chance in your life, and we're very happy to see that um, you're making most out of that. So thank you so much for sharing your story, and definitely um, we take note of all the recommendations um, you have. It's, it's very good to hear that from you, from your experience, and it gives us really concrete ideas on, you know, what, what we could do to improve. Um, and I think this leads us nicely to the next presentation, Anna, who's already sitting there next to Rania, who is going to tell us a bit more about the guidelines uh, that were developed under the COMMIT project about mainstreaming gender in pre-departure orientation. Um, so as we heard from Rania, she as well as other refugees went through pre-departure orientation. Um, in her case, it was a three-day um, course before departure. And uh, we have been doing some thinking as IOM on how we can improve also gender aspects in the pre-departure orientation to already start from the very first phase of, you know, the, the resettlement and integration continuum to think about, you know, the specific needs of women, girls, um, and uh, it's important that we address this uh, early on in the process. So um, I give the floor to Anna Giustiniani, who is the COMMIT project manager and who will tell us a bit more about the guidelines on mainstreaming gender in pre-departure orientation. Anna, you have the floor. Thank you, Gatrain. Thank you uh, very much to the many participants who are here with us today. So to continue with the tradition of the COMMIT webinars, as Gatra um, said before, also the present one, is linked to the launch of one of the tools that uh, 
are envisaged by uh, the Commit project. These guidelines aim to provide practitioners, in particular those who work directly with refugees, with some key tools to be able to systematically integrate gender into PBO training. And we will see this uh, while I go through the presentation. Why have we decided to focus on gender? As Savania uh, just told us, the resettlement process triggers in refugees a number of changes. And among these, probably one of the most challenging ones are the changes in gender role. If those changes are not addressed in a timely manner, they can uh, uh, exacerbate and become gender inequalities. So it is therefore very important for PDO training to incorporate and to take into account all gender concerns and gender concepts as part of the process throughout. Why have we decided to focus on PDO? I think this, uh, this question is already an answer. Uh, the European Commission has recognized this is an essential feature of successful integration, as pre-departure orientation is there to equip and empower, as Rania told us, refugees prior to their departure, to inform them about their rights, but also about their responsibility and obligation. The primary role of uh, pre-departure orientation is, in fact, to help equip refugees with the skills and knowledge they will need when they arrive in a new country. Uh, part of this involves anticipating and discussing concerns as well as potential changes in gender settings and gender roles. And if we, under if we understood that if we do this during the PDO, uh, refugees will not find these changes as a shock when they come to the new country. In addition, doing so would also possibly contribute to reduce existing gender inequalities by ensuring that all individuals, men, women, girls, boys alike, enjoy equal rights, responsibilities, and opportunities regarding, regardless of the sex they, they uh, determine at, at birth. How did we get here? Um, how did we develop this, this guideline? Um, we collected a number of inputs by the refugees themselves, by the PDO trainer, from the staff in the reception centers in their settlement countries, and we started a very long um, brainstorming activity. We follow a participatory approach coordinated by an external expert. Um, that has trained the content uh, as you will see it in, in, uh, in the guidelines. So, and I'm sure colleagues will soon share with you the uh, link to the uh, English version of, of the guidelines. So, we realized that a lot is already there, a lot is already done, but especially the trainers voice their need to see these concepts that are entrenched in our day-to-day -day life, better framed. So the need for this guidelines to be to be developed. So the results you can see here, uh, the table of content, this is meant to be a very uh, user-friendly guideline. Um, it's made of three main sections and uh, three uh, analysis. Uh, as I said, it's already available in English, as the link you can see in the chat. Uh, it will soon be available in a few days in the other four languages of, um, of the project, namely uh, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Croatian, and Italian. In practice, mainstreaming gender into video training means uh, that uh, experiences, concerns, and expectations by women, girls, men, and boys are an integral part of the, of the process of developing the training. This includes, of course, training with assessment, design, development, and delivery and evaluation of, of the PDO. With the ultimate objective being that PDO training must ensure that all refugees benefit equally from the training and that the training does not reinforce discrimination. 
tonight. Thank you. Gender content it should be mainstream throughout the process, as I just said, and should be introduced in a progressive and non confrontational manner during the touring activities. Uh, possibly through activities that encourage participants' reflection and direct uh, participation in the definition uh, of the concept rather than just imposing ideas that are new to the participants. Challenging and deconstructing gender roles that have proved to be a very sensitive and long term task. One way of ensuring that gender is mainstream into video is to adopt a gender inclusive language. Language as part of everyone's culture comes with a number of embedded preconceptions. For instance, that we often say cleaning lady, landlord, policeman, uh, which always try to um, detach functions and roles from, from sex at birth. So we can say uh, cleaner, owner, police force. This is something that uh, uh, we may be doing, um, but in, in the in the guidelines you will see this is uh, this is uh, a key element, uh, a key invitation when developing and implementing uh, the uh, pre-departure orientation training. To conclude, next slide, and linking with what we have been saying. Um, also with, with Rania, video training provides an excellent opportunity to start establishing links between pre-departure and post-arrival phases and societies. Ideally, as Rania told us, during video uh, sessions, participants would have the opportunity to start interacting with peers that have already gone through the same experience and are settled in the resettlement country uh, with community mentors, with reception staff. Mainstreaming gender in video is indeed an important part of the resettlement and integration continuum for both the individuals concerned but also the resettlement country itself. Existing training curricula do contain most of the elements required, but these guidelines are meant to address possible gaps and possibly to guide future development. So for this reason, we do uh, invite all of you to have a look at the um, at the guidelines. Uh, I personally found of particular interest the research sections, but also the sections that teach tips on how to design and implement video activities. Uh, we really hope you can find this useful uh, yourself. And please do uh, share with us your comments, because this is a, a living document, and we'll be very happy to hear from, from you. And Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Please mute. Yeah. Sorry, because there's a big echo there otherwise. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for, for introducing these um, guidelines. And uh, I have posted in the chat the link to the publication. So we just launched this today at the occasion of the webinar. It means uh, you participants are the very first persons to see those um, guidelines. You will find it in the chat. So if you click there, you can actually download um, the document. And indeed, the guidelines look at how can we consider, you know, gender aspects uh, right away from the design of the pre-departure orientation, the needs assessment, all the way through the implementation, the training activities, and the evaluation. Now, I see some questions from the participants, um, Anna. So if that's fine, I will um, address these um, questions um, to you. Um, the first question is whether uh, there are any examples uh, in the guidelines of activities that encourage participants' reflection. Is this part of it, you know, encouraging participants' reflection on, for example, gender issues? Yes, there are a number of activities. As I said, uh, that particular annex is, is really uh, relevant. There are a number of activities I can perhaps describe one. Um, when a video trainer could share with participants some cards uh, in pairs, showing, for instance, uh, uh, different um, types of uh, jobs. 
um, as I was mentioning before, um, a police a police woman instead of a policeman, um, a woman driving um, a bus or uh, uh, a female uh, teacher. And um, this way, um, those participants who have, for instance, uh, uh, the same card will be asked to um, work together in identifying and challenging uh, the roles, um, and um, they will be asked to share uh, the results with the rest of uh, of the of the of the group participating, so that uh, a discussion can start and and. Uh, pre-defined uh, gender roles can start to be unpacked and, and analyzed further. But there are many activities that can be uh, that can be utilized to this end. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for yeah. Thank you for sharing that example, Anna. Um, indeed, there are many other ideas for possible activities also in in the guidelines that can hopefully you know give all of you some um, inspiration. Um, I think your answer also links well to, to the next um, question that we have in the chat, which talks about um, the fact that um, refugee um, women, especially those who, who might not have um, higher education, tend to be stigmatized by society and, and are often seen as individuals with no desire of integrating or working and that are only focused on staying at home, taking care of the family while receiving um, benefits from the government. Um, so what could be done to institutionally fight this stigma and help these vulnerable women in their integration process? So it's a question from a participant that relates to perhaps some, some of the stigma associated uh, and the fact that, you know, often um, refugee women being resettled are looked at as, okay, these are women who maybe don't have a desire to work, they want to stay at home with their families. Um, what can we do to, to fight that stigma, you think? So, I think that uh, one first step, I mean, we will need to do uh, many, many different things, but one first step could be perhaps to also uh, recognize uh, um, perhaps also soft skills that this person may have and recognize their capacity to take care of their children, their families, being able to uh, budget the money they have to make sure that the family can uh, can uh, have all what, uh, what they need. So I think recognizing uh, their role in this as as uh, um, as key person in in the family is also very important to to debunk a little bit the stigma that is around uh, uh, women that are there that uh, you know as a as a burden for for uh, for the man who's working or for the society that is accommodating uh, them. And I mean, Rania is an example of this. She has managed to to uh, um, become. Despite all uh, hard and all difficulties, uh, quite soon independent from from the reception system, and I think that uh, um, many efforts uh, at the receiving hand in the resettlement countries should be uh, should be put in place to help um, the women uh, um, recognize their skills uh, to be empowered. Um, to be uh, able to to express themselves, so I think a lot has to be done. Also, at the receiving hand, actually, uh, to to be able to um, fight the stigma. And uh, another aspect, perhaps that Rania also mentioned before, and then I think it was also part of one of the questions, is to uh, perhaps create uh, um, support networks uh, uh, to perhaps also. Um, mentorship schemes that could support the integration as well as the, the actual development of, of the persons that is uh, that is being resettled. So to conclude, I believe that uh, more tools and instruments should be there uh, to be able uh, for, for all the women being resettled to to, to to fully develop themselves uh, in this new uh, in this new environment. Um, and I think, as the uh, Serene was saying at, uh, at the beginning, there are a lot of opportunities uh, uh, 
for us to to uh, come up with new ideas and new solutions to to get to this result. Thank you, Anna. Uh, indeed, uh, empowerment is is very important here, but also combating the stigma, perhaps through promoting, you know, also the 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 success stories, and I think Rania is, is a very good example here of someone who clearly had the ambition to actually go and work and, and manage, and indeed we have to break a bit this image of, you know, the refugee woman who arrives and will just depend on, you know, the welfare system. This is not at all um, the case, and it's important that we combat um, the stigma. Maybe linked to that as well, uh, to share that um, as IOM, we also piloted under our Linkit uh, project the pre-departure skills profiling. Um, as part of the pre-departure orientation, uh, we started looking at, you know, uh, the refugees' um, skills profile. And with skills, we don't necessarily mean qualifications, because you can have a person who, you know, who has skills, although they might not have formal uh, qualifications. And um, we noticed that it really also helped refugee women to, to reflect and see that, yes, I, I, I have skills. Um, you know, even I might not have a university degree or any other form of formal qualification. I do have skills um, and I, 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 I can start, you know, thinking on, you know, how I, I, I will also use my skills uh, when I arrive in, in, um, uh, in Italy or, or in any other uh, destination country. Um, I see also in the chat that um, we have uh, Rana from uh, IOM headquarters with us who would also like to say something. Um, Alice, could you check if it's possible to unmute Rana? Kindly confirm if it's uh, possible, Alice. Anna, you're saying it's possible? <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I mean, this discussion has been ongoing since 30 plus years. I'm doing this resettlement on gender, especially since our case nodes and beneficiaries have always been from regions where culture plays a really important role in segregating gender particularly the stigmatization of women, the role of a woman. I remember many classes with Sudanese and the Somalis and many others where the idea, the prospect of a woman actually having a voice when she gets to the other side was horrific to the men, uh, to actually be the role model, to have rights, all of it. So for me, just what you just said, Gertrude, is really important because it starts before departure. So the more time we have before they leave to empower them and also identifying skills. Yes, they're not going to all be educated or have any education, but if you dig deep, there are skills that maybe in a normal country, like these resettlement countries that we, they, they, they go to might not be, or for them, they don't consider it as a skill, but if you translate it into the language, that we know in Europe and elsewhere is a skill, we can tap onto that and then help them to feel better about themselves that they've actually got a skill, be it bringing up kids, being cooking, whatever it might be. There might be other things. Some are perhaps, you know, what we have uh, back home, uh, the, you call the midwives back home. It's a normal occurrence without a certificate, to be honest. But, you know, it's that kind of thing. So I think both sides need to understand the culture so that the both sides can meet um, in the middle. I will stop here because I have to run for a meeting. I wish you all the best and uh, look forward to hearing more about this and where we get to. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Rana, for uh, your contribution. Uh, in, indeed, uh, I think um, we, we, we all agree that we have to combat the stigma and that the, the earlier also we start in the process, the better. And we hope that our thinking uh, through the COMMIT project can, can also contribute um, to that. Um, but perhaps this can lead us also to the next part where we look at the other side of the uh, resettlement and integration continuum, which is at the post-arrival um, phase. 
and what can be done at post arrival stage also to you know provide um, better services uh, to uh, refugees or other migrants and to include also gender aspects in the assistance uh, that we give to migrant families, women and girls. And we have Elisabeth uh, with us from IOM Belgium, who's uh, managing a project called Equal City that looks at how we can mobilize local authorities and frontline services to better include gender in you know, the integration uh, services they offer. So Elisabeth, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you um, already to the other panelists for the inter interesting presentation, especially Rania for uh, sharing uh, your story. So indeed, today I'll present to you some findings on the work that we've been doing at IOM Belgium um, to mobilize local authorities in EU member states to better include migrants in their services, and in, in particular, how to how they um, include better uh, gender specificities in their assistance to migrants. So we all know that migration is a global uh, phenomenon and that the impacts of migration are most profoundly felt at the local level. If integration policies are generally formulated at uh, the national or regional level, they're mainly implemented through local institutions and services. Um, frontline workers working at the local level are the first ones to provide services to migrants and to respond to their specific needs. And by frontline workers, and I will use this term a lot, um, I mean all people that are in touch with migrants in their daily work. So be it social services, medical, mental health services, legal services, housing, police, schools, um, et cetera. The local actors do not always have the capacity or resources needed to provide uh, tailored support, and especially when assisting um, vulnerable, vulnerable groups of migrants, such as migrant women, migrant children, or um, LGBTQI plus migrants. So let us start by looking at the case of migrant women specifically. Um, we all know that migrants constitute a broad and diverse range, uh, a diverse group. Um, they have different backgrounds, different residence or citizenship status. They migrate for a variety of reasons. Um, we all know that migrants face different situations, so barriers and opportunities when integrating into their host society. Migrant women in particular face multiple challenges when integrate, integrating into European society due to the intersection or combined effect of, amongst others, their gender, their migrant status, their social situation, and ethnic background. The specific barriers that migrant women face confirm the need for a targeted and gender sensitive um, measures to compensate for such inequalities and to promote their integration into their host society. Promoting gender equality in services and thereby promoting equal access to these services for all directly contributes to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is my next slide. Um, so, but which barriers and which needs? Um, before I discuss the work that we've been doing in IOM Belgium, I'd like to quickly go over um, a few observations we made um, during other projects that focused on building the capacity of frontline services to better respond specifically to sexual and gender-based violence against uh, migrants. Um, on my next slide, you will see um, some of the barriers we have identified that would hamper the integration outcomes of migrant women. Um, and these barriers are multiple and structural. So I listed just a few, um, but primarily we should look at the barriers to access services. So this can be due to family obligations. We mentioned it uh, previously. So for example, the lack of access to childcare, which makes it hard to attend language classes or training, um, a lack of knowledge of services simply because of a lack of information received or because of language barriers. Um, we also see multiple legal and administrative barriers. So, especially in the case of um, family reunification, for example, um, where you have a legal dependence on uh, the sponsor, um, a, a migrant woman can then face delays um, in her right to work, which can cause also social isolation. Um, there's also a risk of expulsion in case of a separation. Um, and also, as Rania mentioned, difficulty to have documents or qualifications or skills uh, recognized. Then overall, we see uh, we saw also a gap in access to protection services more specifically. So 
especially um, legal support, shelter, uh, mental health support, and in cases of gender-based violence, many other elements that hinder um, the access for survivors to specific services. So um, there's a lack of trust in authorities, but also uh, fear of retaliation, risks of stigma, um, fear of not being understood, of being discriminated against, and overall, actually, of, um, of going through a painful uh, or traumatizing experience again. Um, health services play a very important role in, um, in support and integration to especially survivors of gender-based violence. They can be an entry point to other services. But also here, um, the women that we worked with in our project witnessed a lack of cultural sensitivity and understanding by service providers of the health needs and rights of migrant women. Um, and all of these elements, of course, are even um, more important when we work with uh, women that are in an irregular situation. So in this very short presentation, I will, of course, not um, assess the structural reasons behind these barriers and gaps, but I'll take a more practical approach and look at the role that local authorities can play. Um, and since this presentation focuses on the mobilization of frontline services, I would also like to quickly underline uh, the need that they have raised um, through uh, our activities as well. So on the next slide, please. Um, so most frontline workers that we worked with expressed uh, really a need for training on gender and migration, so including the vulnerabilities linked to migration, the specific needs um, of migrant women and girls or LGBTQI plus migrants. Um, they told us they have faced difficulties to overcome cultural barriers. So they have a fear of stigmatizing um, when talking about topics such as sexual and reproductive health, domestic violence, harmful social norms. Um, and there's also a fear of re-victimizing um, a person when, when talking, for example, about tra traumatic experience or even uh, the migration journey. Um, and the question of migrants' rights also comes back a lot, um, especially when we're working with people, of course, in a regular situation, but when does a person have access to medical care, under which circumstances, how do we refer um, a person to a shelter, but also the case of um, discrimination on the labor market or on the housing market is something that comes back a lot. Um, and the last point is also the not knowing to which services uh, to refer someone. So a, a lack of knowledge, let's say, of other social services and a lack of coordination between existing services. Um, so based on these experiences, we developed the Equal City Project, which Gilfra uh, mentioned, um, which is a project that aims at building the capacity of frontline services at the local level on the topic of migration and gender, and more, more specifically, on the topic of sexual and gender-based violence against migrants. Um, on the next slide, you will see, so the aim of the project is to develop really practical training, uh, training tools and awareness raising materials um, to be usable in different city contexts um, and for all types of uh, frontline services that I, I mentioned already before. Um, with the tools that we have developed, um, the, the beneficiaries, let's say, for the first line services that will receive the tools uh, will be better equipped to tackle four topics in particular. Um, so in the city of Brussels, we're developing tools on um, the development of safe spaces for LGBTQI plus migrants. So this will include guidelines and, and training materials. Um, in Luxembourg, we look at how to identify and respond uh, to sexual and gender-based violence against migrant women and girls specifically. So this includes having increased knowledge on topics such as uh, trafficking, domestic violence, female genital mutilation, how do you assist uh, someone that you have identified as maybe being, being a, a victim of gender-based violence. Um, in Rome, we are developing tools that look, in, that look at how to assist um, unaccompanied migrant children through mindfulness exercises. So really looking at stress reduction and also um, training uh, legal guardians and social workers that work in reception centers. And then the last one is the city of Gothenburg, where we look at how integration services um, can um, discuss and tackle questions of um, violence in a family sphere, and then more specifically, uh, the question of honor-based violence. Um, 
And let's see. So all the training tools that we're developing, they will develop, will include an introduction, of course, to gender and migration broadly, but then elements of cultural awareness, protection of vulnerable migrants, um, an introduction to the legal frameworks at the global, at the local level, um, and then provide information on diversity, non-discrimination, and equality principles. The tools will all pay special attention to the fact that migrant communities may suffer discrimination um, on multiple grounds and be more vulnerable to violence, not only by the host population, but also by members of their own community. Some of the tools will include also awareness, raising uh, material that will be aimed um, at migrant communities and at frontline services themselves. So to make sure that our toolboxes that we're develop at this stage developing um, would benefit as many cities as possible across the EU, we reached out to city networks and organizations at local, national, and EU level. Um, you'll see on the next slide um, just a few of the, of the networks that we're working uh, with. And those are, those are networks and organizations that focus their activities um, mostly on migration and also gender equality. Um, the response to uh, the project so far has been very positive. Um, on the next slide, you will see we have, for the moment, 30, it's quite small, I think, but 30 uh, confirmed trainee cities on board. So these cities will be cities benefiting from the tools once they're finalized. Um, some of the questions that we received from cities is the fact that their services do not directly engage with migrants. So in this case, we explained that um, Actively engaging in the, in the integration process does not mean uh, the local authorities need to do everything on their own, right? There, there are a number of possible partners like local migrant organizations, civil society, or even the private sector that can contribute to the process. But the cities can play an important role of integrating, um, of initiating integration measures, um, of coordinating and facilitating activities providing spaces for activities or putting different actors in touch. So the project is now ongoing for a year um, and the tools are um, being reviewed by a panel of experts and will be ready um, in, uh, at the end of next year. And of course, I'm taking the opportunity here as well to invite any local authority interested um, in, this, uh, in this initiative to, to reach out to me. So my time is very short and I will end just with a few lessons learned, uh, which are based on, um, on Equal City, on the development uh, of the project and the implementation so far, and the things that we thought would be important for us to share today. And it's my last slide. Um, so first and foremost, um, we have to shift the focus, and I think we, we mentioned it just before as well, um, shift the focus from seeing women and other groups exposed to discrimination and gender-based violence as victims, seeing them as survivors and as actors of change. Um, perceptions of women as vulnerable and in need of protection renders their voice and agency, uh, an agency invisible and hinders a nuanced understanding of their different experiences. Um, we have to include as much as possible the target groups in the development and implementation of projects. So in our case, for Equal City, Include migrant women, uh, include LGBTQI uh, migrants in, your, in the development of your activities, and also frontline workers themselves. Um, build trust also through communi community engagement. Engage with the diaspora. Work with intercultural mediators. Um, follow a needs-based approach. Uh, what are frontline services missing? What are the barriers that migrants face? What training is needed? Um, and adapt your training tools um, related to the input that you will receive. Base part of the training on de deconstructing your own stereotypes and your own prejudice. Um, discuss gender stereotypes, racism, discrimination. How inclusive is your service? Is it safe? How can you improve it? And overall, try as much as possible to foster mutual uh, learning between frontline actors, between cities. Um, again, include migrants themselves in the process. So to finish this presentation, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. So indeed, to all participants, if you have any questions, feel free to use uh, the chat and address the questions to all uh, panelists. Um, so thank you, Elizabeth. I, I think it's very good also to see 
the connections between the Equal City project and the COMMIT project. Um, we have, of course, you know, a more specific target group under COMMIT with the resettled refugees, but I think a lot of the work that you're doing under Equal City and in particular the tools that you're developing could really also um, benefit us. And although you're looking at, let's say, a broader group of, of, of migrants, including refugees, I believe that, you know, the approaches you're, you're taking and the tools you're developing are, are very relevant um, for resettled refugees um, as well, because it's a question of, you know, how we, can we adapt the services, particularly, you know, those available at a local level, and how can we make sure that those um, services also cater for the specific needs um, that, that women or girls um, might have. And I also like, you know, what you put here under the lessons learned survivors as agents of change. I think this comes back to the previous discussion on combating the stigma and also, you know, um, representing, you know, the, 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 the positive change um, and, 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 you know, women as agents of change and not just as, as victims. Um, I see a first question in the chat, which could be of interest to others as well. When will the tools of the project be available, um, Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. Um, so right now we have uh, uh, the, the draft versions of the tools, which are, the, are being um, uh, reviewed by an expert panel, and we will pilot them throughout next year. So hopefully by November 2021, we, have, uh, we will have the finalized tools ready to be distributed. We are looking forward uh, to that. And indeed, yes, for any of the local authorities who are online, if, if you are interested um, in the uh, Equal City approach, in the toolkit, in also the capacity building, uh, please do reach out. Perhaps, Elizabeth, you could provide the link to the Equal City webpage also in the chat so that uh, participants can go there and, and look for more info. Um, I also have another question um, here related to um, victims of um, trafficking. Um, if you have any idea about, you know, um, trafficking and what's the main country of origin and what kind of guidelines um, is uh, the, the project you're working on intending to uh, develop to, to handle specifically, you know, the question of victims of trafficking. Is this a topic you're looking into as well? And, and you know, how does this reflect yeah. in the guidelines or, or yeah. the toolkit? It's a very good question. And um, so, like I, 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 we have these four different toolboxes that have really one specific focus, each of them. Um, trafficking will um, I believe only really be uh, looked into uh, in the toolbox that looks at gender-based violence against migrant women and girls. And there, there will be normally a module that would also cover um, the topic of trafficking and then looking more specifically at um, um, at, at protection of, of uh, victims and how to assist as a, really as a frontline service, how to identify and how to assist the victim of trafficking and most importantly, how to correctly refer the person to the right services, right? Um, so yes, I would say that in, in that toolbox, that will be definitely uh, one of our focuses. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, for um, sharing this. So please uh, do put the link in the chat. And uh, for the participants, in the meantime, we've also uh, put in the chat the link to the AMIF call for proposals that was mentioned by Severin. So you can click on the link, you will go directly to the call for proposals, which addresses issues related to integration, like the ones we discussed here now with Elizabeth, but also issues related to, for example, complementary pathways um, in addition to resettlement. Um, so encouraging all of you to, to have a look at the call for proposals and, of course, to apply should you have good uh, project ideas. And finally, also to let you know that we are on Twitter. Uh, our IOM office in Brussels is live tweeting about the meeting. Please uh, do follow us and share with your uh, networks. You will find also the information in the chat. So I think that with this, we've gone through all our sessions of um, the webinar, except for the closing. Um, so I'm just checking with um, colleagues. Um, I think there are no further questions at this point in the chat. I don't see anything. So I think um, 
With this, I would then like to close um, our webinar and thank all the participants who have been uh, with us um, today. We hope this was useful for you to have um, some ideas on how we can um, improve uh, gender mainstreaming, both at pre-departure stage as well as, you know, post-arrival um, integration phase. Um, it's one out of, you know, the many webinars that we are organizing under COMMIT, so definitely we will keep you in the loop of the next webinars. Uh, there are more tools that we are developing, so we would like to share them with you in next uh, webinars, um, of course. Um, so with this, uh, thank you to all the speakers. Um, thank you, Rania. Thank you, um, Anna. Uh, thank you, Severin. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I also come to the conclusion that we had, you know, a very <laughs> female panel for today <laughs> for our topic. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for contributing. Uh, we will also share with all participants the link to the recording of the webinar in case you missed some parts, in case you want to watch it again. Uh, you will receive the link to the recording together um, with uh, the publication. So uh, with this, I close our webinar for today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you soon in one of the next uh, COMMIT webinars. Thank you and goodbye.